Hello from Clio Cloud Conference 2018 in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm Victor Lee. And I'm Jason Morris. And we're on the road with Legal Talk Network. And we're back. Thank you so much for joining us on the road. It's a pleasure to be here in Cajun country. Today we're talking about law and code with Jason Morris, one of the uh, speakers here at the uh, Clio Cloud Conference. But before we get started, we'd like to thank our longtime sponsor, Clio, whose conference is being featured in the series of episodes. If you like what you're hearing, why not check out their conference for real, along with 1,500 other legal professionals at next year's 2019 Clio Cloud Conference. For more information, visit cliocloudconference.com. That's C-L-I-O cloudconference.com. And now let's get down to it. I'm here again with Jason Morris, and he is the, uh, I'm sorry, what was your title at Roundtable Law? Lead Legendary Counsel. That's one of the great things about working for yourself. You get to choose your own count, your own title. <laughs> Lead Legendary Counsel. That's a good one. I'll, I'll have to keep that one in mind. So anyway, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became so legendary? <laughs> Thanks. So I'm, uh, I'm a guy who was a uh, database analyst and a computer programmer before I went back to school and ended up in law school. So law is a second career for me, and I've been trying to uh, figure out how to best combine the two skill sets, the, the programming skill set and the, and the legal skill set. And so I've ended up in a master's program at the University of Alberta where I'm uh, studying computational law, programming languages that can be used for automating legal reasoning, things like that. And uh, I was uh, just delighted to be invited to come down and, and share some of that with the people here at the conference. Great. So your session here at the Clio Cloud Conference was entitled Law as Code, Options for Automating What You Know About the Law. Mm -hmm. So could, for people that weren't able to attend, could you talk a little, bit about, a little bit about your presentation and just hit some of the high points and sure. just generally what you talked about? Sure. So um, basically just uh, introducing the, the particular kind of technology that I'm researching and that I'm talking about here today. There's a lot of tools out there that will let you do things like web interviews and document automation. I was looking at a subcategory of them, the tools that have to do with uh, declarative programming. So these are tools where instead of telling the computer how to do something, you just tell it what you want it to do. And actually, it's the same kind of language that we use when we're writing contracts, when we're writing legislation. We write those things declaratively. So declarative programming languages are actually really intuitive for lawyers. Um, and really effective for building tools really quickly. And then I kind of went through a set of examples of different tools that are out there, uh, looked at Neoto Logic, looked at uh, Oracle Policy Automation, uh, another open source tool called DocAssemble. All three of those are for online interviews. Uh, and then I also looked at a, uh, a programming language called Ergo AI, which is offered by Coherent Knowledge. And I, I went through a demonstration of getting a computer to answer an LSAT question using Ergo AI. And, uh, and then talked about uh, a few other things out there, Legalese's L4 language, uh, the Accord Project's Ergo language, and uh, also Regulation as a Platform, which is a project out of Australia. And then I kind of gave my pitch as to why I think programming is a thing that all lawyers are going to be doing at some point very soon. I don't know how many of these conferences you go to, but it seems like there's always talk about just, you know, the automation sort of in that sense of like document automation, process automation, and things along those lines. Um, but your talk obviously focused on a little bit different, a little bit mm -hmm. more from, um, like you said, kind of like the point of view of just looking at the law as a whole. So what is, what is sort of the main difference like with that type of thinking? Why, and how much of a shift do you think that requires lawyers to have to make in the way that they think already? So I don't know if it matter, like if it requires that big a shift in the way that lawyers think. I think I'm perfectly um, straightforward with people. The tools are not there yet. But what you can see from the tools that we have right now is that if you're building something uh, with these kinds of technologies that is designed to solve one problem at a time, uh, for example, building a web interview that can answer a single legal question, the tools are getting way better and easier and easier to use and much more within the realm of what it's possible for lawyers to learn how to do. I think the next phase of that process is for that kind of ease of use to come to general purpose tools. And when that happens, I think you're gonna end up with software tools that lawyers are gonna look at and they're gonna, it's not gonna require a way, a change in how they think about things. They're going to look at it and they're going to recognize that interface as how they have always thought about things, except now they can get the computer to do it. So I'm very optimistic that there's a lot changing in the tools and uh, it's gonna get to the point where um, we're gonna have something that is for lawyers what spreadsheets are for accountants. 
how long do you, have to, do, you think, do you think we'll have to wait for, the, the, like you said, the tools to get to that point? I'm an optimistic guy by nature, so I would be likely to kind of underestimate the amount of time, probably. But I feel like it's realistic to think that in the next five to ten years, there's going to be a, uh, a general purpose deductive logic tool that does for lawyers in deductive logic what spreadsheets do for people in math. Um, where it's it's straightforward to use and you can see what it's doing. Uh, actually, on the flight to New Orleans for this conference, as I was thinking about these things, I had an idea pop into my head about what that interface might look like. So um, I'm going to have to sit down and draw some pictures and talk to some people and see if that would work. But I feel like it's a thing that's coming, like around the corner. Fair enough. Um, so the other the other thing that you talked about was just lawyers as coders and whether or not, I mean, I, I think you went through the exercise, the, you know, how many lawyers think that they should also be coders or something along those mm-hmm. lines. One thing that uh, I, I always kind of wondered about, because, you know, very often at these conferences you hear about people, you know, a big reason why they have these tools in the first place is so that lawyers can delegate responsibility or do thi- or get other people to do things that they're not comfortable doing or they're not, you know, they can focus instead on, like, the important things, like mm-hmm. the stuff that they went to law school for, like, you know, writing the next brilliant brief or, you know, winning that case or whatnot. So for the lawyer that, that went to your presentation is like, well, forget that. I'm just going to hire somebody to do it for me. Or I'm going to, you know, hire some really smart kid who understands this stuff better than I ever will. Like, what do you say to that, to that person? Whenever you tell lawyers that, um, th- there's an opportunity here to use uh, programming languages in order to automate uh, legal services. I think there's an assumption that what we're talking about is the legal services that the lawyers provide. That's not the case. When accountants were gifted with spreadsheets in 1979, it changed what they were able to do. It changed what uh, the kinds of questions they were able to answer. They were now able to answer what if questions. So they could they could change the data and run the same calculation seven or eight times and, and then give you options. That was a new service. It was never done before that because it wouldn't be reasonable to have an accountant sit down and do math for that long at their hourly rate. In the same way, right now, if you were to ask a lawyer, hey, I'm thinking about making this change to my standard form contract in my bank and I want you to tell me whether or not that change is going to cause any of these seven problems across the 300,000 existing contracts that are in place with all their different fact scenarios. We would never pay a lawyer to do that. A lawyer could do it, but we would never pay for it because it's not worth what it would cost to have a human being do the reasoning that would be required. So this technology should not be looked at in terms of whether it's going to allow a lawyer to do something faster that they're already doing, at least not exclusively. It should also be looked at in terms of whether it's going to make it possible for lawyers to provide services that have never existed before. And making sure that that process of translating the problem into the software has been done accurately is going to be a lawyer's job in the same way that you don't need an accountant in order to run a spreadsheet, but making sure that the spreadsheet is doing the calculations properly might be something that you would ask an accountant to double check. So there's going to be new roles for lawyers. There's going to be new services. And it's, uh, it's not just about automating things that lawyers are already doing. Even to the extent that this technology can be used to automate things that lawyers could be doing now, typically they're such low-value services that lawyers aren't actually offering them, right? So it's, it's the kind of thing where it's not worth it to have... Uh, a person come into a law office and sign a retainer agreement and deposit funds into trust in order to answer a legal question that really only takes the lawyer about 15 minutes to figure out. That's not an effective structure to offer that service. But if that same question can be automated and it can be turned into a web form, it might be worth having a lawyer make sure that that form was, that uh, website was well developed and it might be worth the client paying five bucks to get that answer. So we're not replacing what lawyers are doing now. We're offering services that aren't offered by lawyers and aren't offered by anybody. Well, that definitely sounds interesting. I mean, I mean, in order to accomplish that, it's almost like you, you know, you'd almost have to like revamp even just the way lawyers are trained and the way that they learn about the law at law schools. Yeah, that's true. But I don't think that that should be terribly surprising. When spreadsheets came out, accountants had to learn spreadsheets. And it became a standard course that you you take as you're going through. I mean, it's a standard thing that 
people in high school learn now. So yeah, I, I don't think that that's an obstacle. I think the if you were to try and convince law, uh, law schools to start teaching the programming languages that exist right now, right now you, you need to do some convincing. There are some good things that are being taught. Neota Logic has a great program where they do uh, nonprofit work with students who are learning how to use their tool. Um, I'm hoping that there will be more things like that in the future. But when we get the kind of general purpose, easy to use tool that I, I think is coming, no one's gonna need any convincing. It's gonna be perfectly obvious that this should be a part of the curriculum and everyone's just gonna make it happen. Great, that was pretty much what I had for you then. Before we close it out today, I have one last question. If your listeners would like to follow up with you, what is the best way that they can reach out to you? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear from people who are interested in this stuff. Uh, my website is www.roundtablelaw.ca. And uh, I am on Twitter, at RoundTableLaw. And uh, you can also get a hold of me by email. It's jason at RoundTableLaw.ca. Excellent. Well, we've reached the end of the road for today's episode. I want to thank our guests for joining us today. We want to also thank our listeners for tuning in. If you like what you've heard, please rate us on Apple Podcasts. And we'll see you next time for another episode of On the Road with Legal Talk Network. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS, find us on Twitter and Facebook, or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.